strongest request to be on the vlog I've ever had. It was like, you're putting <laughs> me on the vlog. Me on the vlog right yeah. now. I know. Okay. Do you want to be on the vlog? I don't know who you are. Do you want to be on the vlog? Oh, man. Well, you are now. There you go. All right. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing today? Are you in the monster? Or? Sick. How much do you have? 70,000. That's my annoyed face. <laughs> Finding more friends. Oh, yeah. oh he's like, we're on his vlog. You're on my vlog. Oh my god! Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> There's so much camera action happening right now. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Vlog. We're gonna be on your vlog apparently. This is very yeah. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I know it's been a while since my last video and a while since the video before that and a while since the video before that. And a lot of that came from how many tournaments I really played in Vegas. A lot of that came from getting home from Vegas and really just needing a post WSOP kind of hangover recharge type thing. And some of it was honestly just procrastination and laziness, but I'm back. As some of you will have seen in the last video, I am experimenting with a new format, and that is because I am working with someone who is editing my hand histories for me. And I had a lot of mixed feelings about doing this just because I kind of have my own process, I'm used to doing it, and having control over everything makes it kind of easier in the sense that my workflow is standardized and I know what's going on. That being said, Making the hand histories is slow. So I am uh, working with a guy who is doing some of this for me. His name is Rob. And uh, we're, we're kind of just in a trial period here. We're gonna try this out and uh, you know work out the kinks. So let me know what you guys wanna see in the hand histories if, uh, if there's stuff missing. I, I was aware that there was no pot size in the last video and uh, it's something that I kind of wanted to see how much people would uh, care about and it's I'm glad kind of to see that uh, people realize how important it is and uh, that's going to be in this one. But kind of keep in mind that this is going to be a bit of a process. There's going to be some growing pains and it is what it is. Uh, I I'm excited to start working with this guy Rob because uh, ultimately it's going to save me time and should push me toward being able to put out videos more often. That all being said, I still plan to be in control of more of like the creative stuff and uh, I'll still be doing the same kinds of videos. However, this is gonna potentially free me up to do some other types of content on the channel. The number one thing that I'm considering doing is actually starting to stream on YouTube uh, and possibly Twitch, but specifically YouTube right on the channel. And my motivation for doing this is basically that since coming home from Vegas, a big part of what I've been spending my time doing is just grinding online tournaments. There's a lot of benefits that come from playing online, and a big part of that is just being able to get reps in without leaving home, without traveling. Because I'm doing this anyway, I kind of figured it might be something you guys want to see, it might be something you guys want to uh, participate in, and so yeah, consider this a semi-informal announcement type deal. Um, but also just let me know in the comments if that's something you'd be interested in tuning in for. I would probably be streaming mostly in the evenings on weekdays, um, but possibly a Sunday grind here and there. Just one more major announcement here. I'm going to be going to San Francisco for a stop on the PSPT, PSPC, PSP Moneymaker America Tour thing. Hold on. PSPC, the Poker Stars. Players No Limit Hold'em Championship, which I guess is just the Poker Stars Players Championship for short. And the Moneymaker Tour is basically Chris Moneymaker going around and promoting this tournament. The tournament itself is a $25,000 buy-in and will be held in the Bahamas, I believe at the Atlantis Resort. It's going to have like a huge guarantee on it. On top of that, there's going to be a million just added to first. 
just added just a million dollars that's that's it pokerstars is giving away a bunch of what they're calling platinum passes they are 30k value basically a 25k entry into this event and five thousand dollars for various expenses like lodging food travel all this stuff and they're giving away over 300 of them and one of the ways that they're doing this is by running 86 dollar tournaments and just adding a 30k package this platinum pass to first just adding it and 86 dollars is apparently the amount that chris moneymaker spent getting into the main event through i think multiple satellites basically so the idea of these is that they're just normal tournaments they have prize pools and 30k is added and uh, i think that's pretty cool so i'm going to be heading out to san francisco for one of the stops and i'll be going to a couple other stops as well be announcing those a little bit later on the channel but August 24th to 26th is when I'll be out in San Francisco. And uh, you guys should definitely go check out the uh, tournament. I believe it's at Lucky Chances. Lucky Chances. So it's going to be at Lucky Chances. I'll be there August 24th to 26th. If you're in the area or even remotely close to the area, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, it should be a really good turnout for the event itself. And again, this 30k package up top is pretty much a can't miss. And last but certainly not least, the other thing that's been taking up my time is still Beyond Tells. Uh, a lot of people are kind of baffled that it's still going on, that it's still being worked on. Uh, but the truth is the magnitude of this course is incredible. I'm not going to give you a big spiel about it, but beyondtells.com slash training. You can go check it out if you want. Uh, no pressure if not. And uh, yeah, I get a little bit of a kickback if you end up signing up. So that's pretty cool too. So finally, Monster Stack Day 2. I know you guys have been excited to hear about it, and those of you who are following along, again, thank you for that. Uh, it, it was great having your support. But for those of you who weren't able to follow on social media during the event, uh, these hands will all be brand new to you, and maybe you don't even know how I ended up yet. Uh, if you don't want a spoiler, then just don't look it up. I, I, I think there's probably going to be comments about it, but you know, try to hold it in, guys. You don't need to give it away. So the Monster Stack day two was interesting because like I said in the last video I came in off of some pretty crazy run good along with some bad play from day one and I sort of wanted to reset uh, you know make sure I was in the right headspace and I think for the most part I accomplished that but this first hand right away kind of shows how no matter how good your mentality is sometimes things just go wrong and uh, and that's you know that's kind of just the tournament life so we're here on day two. The blinds are 500, 1,000 with a 100 ante. Um, monster stack is cool because you start so deep on day one that by the time the structure sort of slows down with the blinds, uh, hopefully you've you know chipped up enough and uh, your stack's kind of had the chance to maintain. So I'm sitting here with about 35,000 and uh, middle position is someone who's been pretty active so far, has raised a couple of times this level. And he raises now to 2,500, which is a standard open. I'm in the big line with 8-7 of spades, and I have a pretty standard defend here, so I call. The flop comes Jin. Jack, 10, 9, rainbow. I check it over to him, hoping that he's going to see bet, and he does with 2,200. I have a little bit of an option here between check calling and check raising, but I felt that he was going to... Um, not really get away from over pairs and any of his value hands and i also thought that there were so many cards that might kill some action basically any seven eight uh queen or king on the turn might kill some action and he might be willing to put in a lot of blinds with say queen jack king jack um maybe even a hand like ace queen wouldn't fall to a raise now so i put in a raise to 6500 and without too much thought he just ends up going all in now even in game, I was sort of baffled by this, and I, I wasn't really like fist pumping, but at the same time, it was one of those spots where I didn't feel he would necessarily always just jam with king-queen at this stack depth, and I thought on a rainbow board he might play straights a little bit slower, whereas with sets and two pair, he's a little more likely to just shovel it in, kind of for the same reasons that I wanted to check raise. So I call it all in, and sure enough, he has the nuts with king-queen, and he covers me. And so it's looking like I'm going to have a very early exit on day two. Uh, the turn, 
however, is a queen. And I'm, mind you, I'm already out of my chair. I'm kind of doing the mandatory, you know, doing the safety dance where you kind of got to get out of the chair, get the jacket on, get your backpack on, uh, pick up your water or your beverage, get like halfway out the door. And by the time I'm there, a king hits the river and we chop it. We have the same straight, king high straight. I have the seven card straight, but we both have a straight. So this was kind of crazy. Uh, this is by far the biggest suck out I've ever had in a, probably any format, but especially in a live tournament setting, especially on a day two, especially for a decent amount of blinds. And even though it was only for a chop, I think this is by far and away the biggest suck out in terms of equity that I could have possibly ever had. So with new life breathed into me directly from the poker gods, I went on a little bit of a run. In this hand, middle position opens to 2,500, and I'm in the low jack with aces, and I bump it up to 7,200. Middle position calls, and we're going heads up to a flop. The flop comes 973, two tone. I C bet 7,600, and he raises to 30K. It's basically my stack, so I just go all in, and he calls it off with queen 10 of diamonds. Now, the turn's a queen and gives him some additional outs, but the river is an offsuit deuce, and I hold here. He bricks the flush draw, he bricks his two pair and trip draw, and I get more than a double up to get up to 70k at the same line level. So basically from being, you know, a foot and a half out the door all the way up to 70 big blinds, and these hands happen very close together, was very grateful to still be in uh, not even in the money yet. In this hand, we're now at the 600-1200 level with a 200 ante. I've got about 70k in my stack still. I'm in a low jack with king nine offsuit and I open it up to 2700. The big blind is the player who I chopped the 7-8 with the king queen, both having a straight, and he ends up calling and we go heads up to a flop. The flop comes ace queen four, all spades, and I have the king of spades in my hand. So when he checks to me, I have a pretty mandatory C bet. He check calls the 2600 and we go heads up to a turn, which is the king of hearts. He checks and this time I decide to check it back because I think I have some showdown value and I don't really think I need to bluff right now. So checking it behind and just picking up my equity here is how I opt to go. The river ends up being the five of spades. So we actually make our hand here, improve to the nut flush and he checks. I bet 12,000 now, hoping that I can make it look kind of bluffy and potentially get called by a weak spade, maybe even occasionally get heroed by an ace X hand. He tanks a pretty long time, asks to even see my stack, but eventually just folds. In this next hand, there's not a ton to say, uh, but one of those hands you kind of just have to mention, under the gun, just open jams. Open jams 25k. And uh, I just wake up in the big blind with pocket kings. So a uh, very clear call. And he's got the queen 10. Board is completely full of bricks. I, I couldn't tell you what any card on it was. But we do knock out a player here and uh, chip up some more. So at this point in the tournament, I think it's worth mentioning that because of how I've been running, I'm starting to get a certain kind of image where I just sort of look unstoppable. And there's an element of that where I am playing well and I've been showing good hands, but there's also an element of that that's a little bit more intangible, where it just appears that I can't be beaten. And there's a lot of things that can happen uh, when you start to get this image, and there's a lot of things you can do to capitalize on it. But I think this hand kind of exemplifies a sort of spot where I might pass normally, but with just how I've been running and how it looks like I am winning every hand, um, this is kind of a good spot. So with that preamble out of the way, let's get into the hand. The blinds are now 1k, 2k with a 300 ante, and I've got about 120,000 in my stack. Under the gun makes it 4,500, under the gun plus one calls, under the gun plus two calls, and I'm in the cutoff with king 10 of hearts, and I think I have a pretty mandatory overcall at this point with such a playable hand and in such a good position. So I call. The big mind calls too, so we go, what, you know, five ways to the flop. It's 8-3-3 three, three, two-tone, but not in hearts, 
And when it checks to me, I think that since this is one of the worst possible hands I can hold here in terms of connecting with the board, and the big blind can still have connected, and since people won't really fold pocket pairs here, I just decided to check behind, occasionally hit a 10 or a king, and just kind of see what happens on the turn. The turn is now the ace of hearts, and it checks to me once again. And at this point, you know, the preflop raiser has checked twice. He shouldn't really ever have an ace. I think he he probably has king high at best, um, maybe pocket fours or something. Uh, the only person who has not had two opportunities to check after the preflop raiser has checked twice is the big blind. So I do expect under the gun plus one and under the gun plus two to usually bet an ace here in this spot, mostly to protect and get a little value. So the big blind's probably the only person who can have an ace here other than me. Because I have a lot of ace x that could check here, and I have a lot of also pretty strong hands that could have potentially checked back the flop. And at this point, I don't think anyone else really can. So that combined with, you know, my image and all this other stuff, I think makes it a pretty slam dunk value bet. Without my image, though, or with a much worse image, I think I would just check behind here and, and kind of let, let the pot go where it goes. Because... Uh, it's sort of a situation that's dependent on what people think of you, and whether they give you credit depends a lot on that perception. But I do end up betting 11,500, and everyone just folds pretty quickly. This next hand, we're at the 1,200, 2,400 blind level with a 300 ante. No, it's a 400 ante. I have about 190k in my stack, and the hijack opens to 5,500. I'm on the button with ace five of clubs. And I decided to 3-bet to 16,000. He calls and only has 55k behind, so I don't know if I love my 3-bet at this point. A call might be a little bit better, but I'm kind of still okay with it. Um, so we go heads up to a flop. The flop comes 954 with two diamonds, and he just open jams 55k. Now, this is a weird spot because I think there are some hands he does this with that potentially beat us, but most of them actually don't. Uh, I, I think with a hand as strong as 8x, he might just check jam. Um, hands like pocket 7s might do this and just try to get us to uh, you know, go away if we have you know, ace-king or something like that, and they don't really want to check call, these sorts of things. But there's also so many available draws, and I just didn't really think he had it this time. So I end up making the call and he's got pocket threes. Turn is an eight and the river is a queen. So I stack that player and add a little bit more to my stack. Now, while I've definitely been running pretty amazing most of the day at this point, this next hand pretty much defined the day and my trajectory beyond this point. The blinds are now at 1500 3k with a 500 ante and I've got almost 300k in my stack. I'm in the cutoff with ace-king suited, and I bump it up to 7k. The button, who has 3-bet me probably 5 or 6 times in the last 2 levels, bumps it up yet again to 23,500. This is pretty big, but I don't really know what to make of that, and uh, he's been sizing a little bit on the large side to begin with. So, when it folds back to me, um, because he's been 3-betting me so much, I decide that a 4-bet is probably in order, and I bump it up to 60k here. He makes the call, and the flop comes ace-8-3, two-tone. Now, this is pretty great because it's just so difficult for him to have a hand better than mine, and even though there's a flusher on the board, I don't think there's going to be a lot of hands that he three bets and calls a four bet with that can even have flush draws here, um, mostly because the ace of suit is on the board. So he can't have ace-5 of spades, ace-deuce of spades, these sorts of hands, he can only really have maybe something like king-queen suited, king-jack suited in spades, and that's just not that many combos. So rather than betting and probably having trouble getting value from much of his range, I decide to check here. He checks it back, so we just go heads up to a turn, which is a 10 of clubs. Now, again, I kind of feel like I'm going to struggle to get a lot of value from him. Uh, at this point, he might start betting worse ace-x for us, so I didn't necessarily feel like I was going to miss a ton of value by checking, and I think it's going to be kind of tough for him to continue with something like pocket jacks uh, or pocket queens if he doesn't uh, get that in pre. 
So I check again and he checks it back once again. On the turn, it probably is better to just bet because the board is getting more coordinated and there are a couple of cards that I don't really wanna see on the river and one of them comes. So it's a jack of hearts on the river and at this point, I don't even know if I can value bet. It's just really, really hard for him to call with something like a weak ace, I think. Uh, that could be wrong, but the thing is, he has to be worried about all the same kinds of hands that I'm worried about. Tens, jacks, ace, king, and I can also have pocket aces, whereas he probably can't. So I, at this point, just check, and he bets 90k. And at this point, he's repping very, very thin. I don't even know if he's value betting ace queen at this point. I don't even know if he's value betting ace king at this point. And it's a little more likely he bets those hands on an earlier street anyway. So I'm definitely not happy with it. I think pocket jacks is the most likely hand by far. In game, I had that feeling. But I just couldn't see myself playing the hand so passively, under repping so hard post flop, and then just folding to one bet, even on this board. So I did eventually sigh call and he shows me jacks. So that was a very frustrating uh, set of circumstances and a run out and I certainly let him get there. I, I'm well aware of this, but I don't necessarily despise how I played it given what I was thinking at the time. I think in post hand analysis though, I definitely prefer just a small bet on the turn. Um, it's gonna prevent hands like jacks from just seeing all five cards for free and putting myself in a weird spot like this sometimes. And it's gonna be pretty hard for him to fold a hand like ace queen or ace jack if he has them as well. In this next hand, the cutoff open jams 40,000. I'm in the big line with pocket sevens and while this is definitely a pretty standard call uh, against you know these positions and the stack depth, I wasn't really happy just because of Kind of how comfortable he seemed and how he'd been playing so far but i do end up calling it off with sevens and he's got aces the flop comes ace eight six which is certainly not the kind of board you want when you have an under pair to aces since he does just flop a set but there were some interesting back doors however the turn was a brick so we don't get to sweat any of them and uh, river bricks out as well so just get a little bit of a hit to the stack here, back quite a bit down from my peak for the day. That being said, this did not last long because with about 100K in my stack and a little bit before dinner break, under the gun opens to 6,500 and middle position jams 55K. I'm in the hijack and I look down at pocket kings once again. I rejam either to just isolate or you know just play it the same way I would play any hand that I have in this spot and Under the Gun ends up calling off for about 75k total. They have uh, Ace King for Under the Gun, and middle position has Ace Jack. So I'm in amazing shape going into the board, and I end up holding on 5, 3, 2, 6, Jack. So pick up a huge three-way all-in pot here, and I'm back over 200k going to the dinner break. Toward this time of the night, I think we we're either in the money or pretty close to the money. I don't remember exactly when the bubble burst, but the min cash on the monster stack was about 2200. So while it was an important bubble for me to get off my chest, off my shoulders, uh, it wasn't a lot monetarily. So my focus throughout the rest of the evening on day two was pretty much chipping up, just trying to make good spots. And uh, for the most part, I accomplished that as you're gonna see in some of these hands. So at this point, we're at the 3K, 6K level, the 1K Annie, and I've got 300K in my stack. Under the gun, I have red pocket jacks, and I make it 13K, and under the gun plus one just jams for 100K. Folds back around to me, and I have a very clear call here. He shows pocket tens, and the board is just nine, seven, three, queen, six. Uh, I don't even know what the suits were, but there was really never a big sweat here. So I get to just pick up another 100K in a very good spot. Um, but, you know, that's the tournament life. It's just such a fortunate situation. There was really no decision making. There was uh, nothing really to do but just raise and call. In this next hand, I have about 400k and middle position opens to 14k. Um, he's got around the same stack size as me. I'm in the big blind with King Jack and I decide to make the call. The flop comes Queen 9-8 with two spades and I check. 
He checks behind, which uh, is a little bit surprising because this is a board that does perform reasonably well uh, for the preflop raiser, um, particularly against a big blind call. The turn's an 8, I check, and he now bets 16k. I felt like this was going to be sort of a delayed c bet a lot of the time, maybe 9x or pocket 10s trying to go for value, and I decided that I was going to check raise and probably barrel most brick rivers. I didn't think that he would have spade draws a lot here either, I thought he would just bet the flop with those, so if a spade came in I would also probably continue if I get called. So over his bet of 16k I make it 46k and he does actually make the call. The river is an offsuit 4 and I bet 76k which I'm not sure I really need to go quite that big um, but at the time I was thinking you know I might need to get him off of jacks or 10s here and uh, might kind of need to make it sort of large just to convince him. However I get snap called by ace 8 and uh, unfortunately I think that's one of the only hands he calls with uh, at this sizing. I mean, he might have some slow plays uh, of jack 10 or something like that, but aside from those, uh, ace eight should be the only eight in his under the gun range uh, for this player. So a little bit unfortunate that we run into it here, um, but don't really hate my play even after the fact. At this point, I am back down to about 240K and I open king queen offsuit in the cutoff to 14K. So the button who has three bet me a bunch um, from the jack's hand and the ace king hand uh, he three bets me now to 38k. I end up just jamming it because I felt that he was going to have a lot of hands uh, that really shouldn't be in there and that he wouldn't be able to call off this amount with. However, he tanks for quite a while and Psy calls it off with pocket tens. However, the board comes king 8 8 9 brick. And I win a flip, a little bit worse than a flip, to double up. So pretty fortunate toward the end of the day here, and I'm now back over 400k. At this point in the day, I've now been table changed, and we're sitting at 4k, 8k with a 1k ante, which I'm pretty sure was the last level of the day. I'm at a new table with new players, but I've been sitting around with them for a little bit, although it's not super relevant to this hand. Got about 500k in my stack, and the hijack raises to 85k with just 15k behind, so... He's effectively gone all in, even though he hasn't technically gone all in. Uh, I'm in the cutoff with ace-jack suited, and I think that just calling here is the right play. If I raise to ISO, I have to put in a pretty sizable amount of my stack, and he's now jammed enough that, well, he hasn't jammed, but he's put in enough big blinds here that I think he kind of creates isolation himself. If we hear from anybody behind us, I'm probably going to just fold, so it's nice to put in fewer blinds before folding, basically. However, it ends up folding around and the flop comes absolutely beautiful from my hand. It's jack three deuce with a three deuce of clubs. So I have top pair and the nut flush draw and there's very, very few hands he has that are ever ahead of me or even in okay shape against me. So he just jams, I call and he has pocket sixes with no club. So he's really just drawing a one out here or um, you know, he could hit the six of clubs and then pair the board, I guess. But the turns the four of hearts, the river bricks out, and uh, I stack this player. So that's pretty much to end up the day. Um, probably played a couple small pots here and there, but there were so many that I played uh, throughout the day that I just, you know, I wasn't really taking note of the super small pots for the most part. I ran really, really good. Uh, I was at risk twice during the day and won both of those, obviously. So it certainly was nice to be validated. Uh, to finally make the money, to finally make a day two, and then also make day three in that tournament. And really, you know, ultimately I felt like I was playing pretty well after playing not that great on day one. So to bounce back from day one and uh, have a better performance, have a better result, it was uh, really gratifying. And uh, again, your guys' support kind of played a pretty big role in that, just keeping me level. And it uh, felt good to kind of finally have that pay off. So heading into day three, I had bagged 659k, and uh, that was good for a little bit better than middle of the pack, and uh, over 50 bigs for day three. It's been a while at this point, but a lot of these hands I remember so vividly because of kind of all that emotionality leading up to it, and I think I didn't necessarily appreciate how much of that kind of piles up 
So really getting the monkey off my back of just cashing, finally making day two and actually cashing um, was really critical. So I think that in situations when you're outside of the WSOP, you're not in the middle of a series and you can take a day off, a couple days off to just decompress is super important. Now in the middle of the series, I couldn't really do that so much. So having a kind of artificial, you know, having an artificial thing that boosted me back up with this cash was really good for me and really important and kind of helped save my summer, to be honest. So I'm gonna go over the rest of the hands in the next video. Remember, if you liked this video, hit the thumbs up button, make sure you subscribe, share with your friends, uh, leave me a comment down below, and remember, tell me what you think about the graphics, and if you wanna see anything else, if there's anything missing, uh, all that good stuff. And I will see you guys for day three of the Monster Stack. Goodbye.